Much has been said about the last days, the end of time, the last generation. Could all three culminate in our day? Breath of Life presents Charles D. Brooks preaching the sermon entitled, Special Message to the Last Generation. This message, based in Revelation, focuses on events impacting our day, this generation. Your friend will be disappointed if you fail to serve notice that Breath of Life is on right now. Is that friend in your home or just a telephone call away? Make contact and come right back. Does the Bible say anything about saying the same prayer over and over so many times? Uh, we, we're getting some very direct questions and we want to give you correct answers from the scriptures themselves. Uh, uh, themselves. I want to turn to the book of St. Matthew and I'm going to look at chapter 6, I believe it is. Give me a moment to see if I can find it. Matthew chapter 6 and... Uh, then we look at verse 7, and this is what the Bible says. Now, you want an answer. This is written in red. These are the words of Christ. The Bible says, but when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Should I read it again? Not necessary to say the same little prayer 50 times, 75 times, or whatever. The Bible says, when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard, for they are much speaking. Those are the words of Christ. Next, please. And this verse is making reference to Mark 16, 12. Did Jesus take more than one form? No, we don't have any record that he did. Jesus was incarnated in human flesh, and thus limited by human flesh. He was thought to be a ghost, simply because the disciples didn't know who he was, from a distance. Next, please. <clears throat> Pastor, what if you're dating someone who is not a believer? What should we do besides pray? Well, you're taking a big chance doing that in the first place. The Bible actually forbids it. I don't think people understand anymore what God really expects of them. But a Christian has a prescribed course. It's found in the Word of God, and God expects a Christian to follow that Word. Would somebody say amen to that? I'm reading 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? One of the most serious things you will ever do on earth is to choose a mate and get married. You need the help of God even when you're doing it in the church. Amen. Would somebody say amen? amen? It is supremely dangerous for a believer to date romantically, get involved with an unbeliever. Not only that, it is forbidden by Scripture. Next please. This is interesting. What about UFOs? Are they for real? And if they are not, what are they and who are they? Some who come off and know we get repeat questions. It simply means that the person probably was not there. There is a text in the Bible that says, as we near the end of time, fearful sight shall be seen from heaven. Now, I must tell you that the government studies UFOs. Most of them, I understand, are identified. There are some that they can't figure out. There are some that are the figments of people's lively imaginations. Sometimes an airplane, these have to do with physical law, sometimes an airplane or something like that can be approaching at a certain angle and light bounces off it in such a way that makes it appear spherical or uh, as something that it is not. Usually they are identified when they don't know what they are, they simply say they don't know. And if they don't know, I don't know. Dr. Brooks, this is interesting. <clears throat> Did Job lose his first wife when he lost everything that he had? When everything was restored back to him, were the children born as babies or did they come back as grown people? <laughs> well, we have no record that Job got a divorce. We think it's the same wife. Not only that, but the children were babies. They didn't come back from the dead. The Bible says the dead return no more. And that pertained in that day as well as today. Next, please. Pastor, if I was baptized once by immersion in a Baptist church, should I be baptized again the same way in another church? No, we deliberately took our time with that the other night. Baptism is a sign of an outward, an outward sign of an inward cleansing. Baptism says to the world, this is my starting place by faith doing what the Lord wants me to do. 
And we read to you from Acts chapter 18, where a man by the name of Apollos, a man by the name of Apollos, went to Ephesus. And the Bible gives you a very fine commendation concerning this man. He was instructed in the way of the Lord, fervent in the spirit, speak and taught diligently the things of the Lord, but he was limited in his knowledge. He knew only the baptism of John. Eventually, as you read on down in the context, Apollos left and went to Corinth, and St. Paul came to Ephesus, where he had been. And Paul found certain disciples, the Bible says. That's verse 1 of chapter 19. He found disciples, converted people who were following all the light they knew. Is that clear? I want to make that very clear. They were following all the light they knew, and they were the children of God. Paul said to them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, we've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Here they were limited, but they were not rebellious. They were not following because they had not been taught. Is that clear? Come on, answer me. Is that clear? They were doing all they had been taught. And when you do all you know, you are a child of God. And as surely as you're born, God will send you full knowledge sooner or later. So Paul then said unto them, Under what then were you baptized? They said, Under John's baptism. Then said Paul, verse 4, Verily John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ. In other words, their focus was John the Baptist. Jesus they hadn't really heard about yet. And the baptism that he uh, set an example in and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So the Bible says, verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized. Now these were Christians. These were God's people, that is. And they were baptized already. Rebaptism was not a denial of their faith. It was an addition being recognized to their faith. Full knowledge had come. And they were baptized again. Would you say amen? amen. Doesn't mean that your first experience was invalid. It simply meant when full light came, you made full commitment and surrender because of your faith in God. When you do that, you're baptized again. Baptism is the door to God's room to church. Next. Pastor, I once heard someone say, if you put children in Christian schools, they don't learn how to deal in the real world. Therefore, is it better for them to be in public school? I know the Bible teaches train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Knowledge of the real world is what causes our young people to be so delinquent today. Amen. Would somebody say amen? amen? Knowledge of the real world is what has corrupted our young people. There are things, you, know, you can see how old I am. And there are things that are utterly shocking to me today, especially amongst our youth. They are entertaining thoughts and practices that I never dreamed of when I was a teenager. You need something to counter this. Wherever I go, I find people, even in church, who figure they got to know about the world in order to avoid it. God told Adam and Eve, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we are told it was never God's will that they should even know what evil was. I want to read you a text that I remember preaching on a long time ago. If I can get to it very quickly. Romans chapter 16 and verse 19. I want you to listen to this. There are people who think I've got to see it all in order to avoid it. You see it all, you might become enchanted and then entrapped. Somebody was trying to defend these filthy movies. They said, but Pastor Brooks, it's just life. And I said, when you see the putrefying body of a dead dog on the highway, rotting and stinking, that's life too. But you don't pay $6 for a chair and sit and watch it for two hours. We are supposed to have delicate sensibilities. Now listen, the Bible says in Romans 16 and verse 19, For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise, wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Wise concerning good, simple, meaning you don't know very much. Young people today are too sophisticated. And sophistication implies experience. And people like that can't blush. Next, please. 
Pastor, this is signed, A Jewish Christian. The Bible says that God created the world in six days and he, res he rested on the seventh day. So doesn't that mean the Sabbath starts at midnight Friday and ends at midnight Saturday? Thank and you. So We're on. just rushing a little bit. A good question, a sincere question, and we haven't had it before. When God created the world, he did not make watches. At midnight, you're supposed to be asleep. And the Bible says, the Bible says, the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the... Now, this is God's plan. This is not Jewish. There were no Jews when Adam and Eve were created. The evening and the morning were the third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, and seventh day. Now, let me read to you what the Bible says. In Leviticus 23... And I'm going to read verse 32. It better be because that's the one I remember. Leviticus 23, 32. And listen, this is what it says. Leviticus 23 and verse 32. Uh, it says, It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest. Ye shall afflict your souls. From evening unto evening shall you celebrate your Sabbaths. Would you say Amen. And over in Mark 1 and verse 32, the Bible says, At evening when the sun did set. Now let's connect this. The evening and the morning made the day. God did not make watches and clocks. He made the sun to rule the day and the moon to rule the night, the Bible says. And so, for all of these centuries, believers who know have observed the day from evening unto evening, not midnight to midnight. This is something happened when, the, uh, when expediency came in. And when folk wanted to spend their nights doing various things, the church began to teach from midnight to midnight. That's not what God taught. It says, from evening unto evening shall you celebrate your Sabbaths. And Mark 1.32 says, at evening when the sun did set. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what I believe and teach. Next, please. Dr. Brooks, how do you know when you are saved? Some teach that you must speak in tongues in order to be saved. They also teach speaking in tongues is the evidence that you're filled with the Holy Ghost. I guess the question is about tongues. Beloved, nowhere in the Bible do you read that you have to speak in tongues to get the Holy Ghost. The Bible doesn't say that. It says in Acts 5.32, And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. To whom? To them, to him that will obey. God gives the Holy Ghost. Now let me read you something in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Of course, you've read that. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am but a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Look how many tongues you speak in if you don't have charity. What's charity? Jesus said, if you love me, do what? And if you don't do that, you're just a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. In chapter 14, Paul gives an exegesis on tongues because this confusion had arisen in Corinth. And Paul said some powerful things here. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesy, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh in tongues, except he interpret. Except what? That the church may receive edifying. Paul is saying, if you got something to say in an unknown tongue, let somebody tell the church what you're saying. It does not happen in this modern, I want to be very kind, but in this modern deception, it does not happen. Nobody interprets. Now Paul says in verse 6, Now brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation, or by knowledge, or by prophesying, or by doctrine? Verse 8, For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare for battle? In other words, Paul is saying, I speak in many tongues. What is a tongue? Let me give you a dictionary definition. A tongue is a language. A tongue is a language. A vehicle for conveying thought and feeling. When you sit and listen to me, you understand what we're talking about. Now, if you're babbling and nobody understands, you are simply a distraction in the service of the Lord. And it says, now if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare for battle? 
just like our army used to do, blow the beagle, the bugle, <laughs> blow the bugle when they wanted men to prepare to charge or for reveille or whatever. Men knew by the sound of the bugle what they were supposed to do. Paul uses that analogy. If you blow the trumpet and it gives an uncertain sound, nobody knows what in the world it means, nobody will be alert. Nobody will do what they ought to do. Paul goes on to say many things. I don't want to take time to read them all. But he said, I speak in tongues more than ye all. This is verse 18. I thank God, and, and forgive me, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. I'm struggling with a bad cold. Forget it now that I've told you. Verse 18. I thank God I speak with tongues more than ye all. Verse 19. Yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Would you say amen out there? In one place, Paul says, if everybody stands up speaking in tongues, people will say, aren't they mad? And that's what they sound like, insane people. And that's the language of this particular chapter. If any man, verse 27, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. What do you mean? If I'm the preacher and I can only speak English, and then I need, come here, Lada, come here a minute. And let's say that we got a lot of dear Spanish people here, and we do. And let's say we have some that don't understand English at all. Here's the way we're supposed to do it. I want you to interpret for me. Beloved, I'm glad to be here. Amados, tengo gusto estar aquí. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yo creo en el nombre de Cristo Jesús. He is our only hope of salvation. Es nuestro único salvador para that, la salvación. That is the gift of tongues in the church. Amen. Did you hear what I said? You understood me who speak English. Our Spanish folk understood him. Now, I've been to places where you have two, one on each side. I was in South Africa, and a, a Zulu was on one side, and a Lesotho on the other side. And if I would say, Beloved, Jesus is coming soon, then I'd wait on this man and that man. Now, the Bible says, if you are going to do that, let it be by two, and at most by three, don't have too many doing it because by the time they all say, you will have forgotten what you were talking about. Uh, maybe we'll deal with this a little further later on. But Paul said, let all things be done decently and in order. God is not the author of confusion. It's right here in this chapter. He's not the author of confusion. What they talk about today as tongues is merely babble, a deception of the enemy. Now I know that there are those who are sincere, and I never belittle sincerity, but God sends truth to enlighten those who are sincere. Would you say amen? amen. One last point, it's in here. Paul said that if you're going to speak in tongues, you gotta have an interpreter. He said tongues are a sign for those on the outside of the church but prophecy is, is for those inside. Now they got it twisted the other way around. If you go to a church where they do this, and you say, what are they saying? Oh, they say, you can't understand it. This is only for the church. The Bible says tongues are assigned to the outside. As on the day of Pentecost, when God gave 12 unlearned men the gift of tongues, the gift of linguistics in an instant, and they went out and began to preach, and all those folk who had gathered from all of those countries understood in their own language it was a sign that something special is happening here, and 3,000 joined the church. But when folks stand up in church and they got a little closed community and they babble in tongues, you please tell me what's the good of it. Next please. This is from a 13-year-old Bible student. Why didn't Satan decide to follow God when he knew what was right? Didn't he have a chance before Christ died on the cross? Oh, yes, beloved. Satan started in heaven as an angel named Lucifer. And the love of God reached out to him. The appeal of God went out to him, but he hardened his heart. I think the point to learn from your question is you can persist in doing wrong so long that you get to the place God cannot reach you. The Bible says your conscience becomes seared. That means burned out. And there are people today that even sociologists and psychologists are saying are 
unconscionable. They have no conscience. Anybody that can explode a truck and kill babies and destroy secretaries and no conscience, demon possessed. Satan went so far he could no longer respond. Next one. Pastor, in Malachi 3.10, God said if we pay our tithes and offerings, he'd bless us. And there should not be room enough to receive it. Why are most of us struggling just to pay our bills? And, Pastor, I don't mean with credit cards. <laughs> Very interesting question. God promised blessings, and I think somebody here needs to know that blessings are more than money. Amen. Would you say amen? amen? You say we're struggling. Thank God you got enough health to struggle with. If God didn't bless you, you couldn't even do that. So let us not speak this way concerning God. And he does keep his word. Can I get a witness from somebody out there? Let me tell you. And we're going to preach about this next week. Go ahead, please. One church teaches Jesus was born in Jerusalem, but King James Version says he was born in Bethlehem. I believe the King James Version. Why would a church teach that Jesus was born in Jerusalem? I don't know. Why would a church teach that the first day is the Sabbath? It's not in the Bible. Why would they teach that the law is done away with? It's not in the Bible. The Bible said, not just the King James, but the Bibles say that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And not only that, the Old Testament forecasted hundreds of years before the fact. Micah 5, 2, and 7. Next, please. Our final question. Please explain the difference between trespasses, sin, and iniquity. I did enumerate those the other night. And when David offered his prayer, he named all three. He said, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly of my iniquities, and purge me of my sin. Three words. They all are kin, but they are uh, varying, uh, uh, varying severity. In the Greek, the word for trespasses means mistakes. We make plenty of those. The one for sin, homotino, means to miss the mark. And iniquity is the worst one. The word to miss the mark uh, suggests shooting an arrow in a bow. Now, this analogy will help you to understand it. If you are totally unskilled and unused to a bow and arrow and you miss the mark, that's trespass. If you have the strength to hit it and you just miss it, that's sin. But if you have the skill and the strength and you deliberately miss it, that's iniquity. Iniquity is sinning against light. Iniquity is sinning against knowledge. Let me be very, very, very pertinent to the times. Iniquity is sinning after C.D. Brooks tells you what the Word of God says and you see it. You disobey God tomorrow and you know better that's iniquity. And that's the worst one.
Amen. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. Hey, Rush. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, Breath of Life Quartet. And they're going to be with us a few days. And we can enjoy their music continually. They are those solemn messages which we preach, prophetic messages. And sometimes we tremble, but we are greatly blessed to have truth from God so clearly given to us from His Word. I'm reading 2 Peter 1.19. And those of you who are now in the habit of jotting down the texts, you'll want to get all of these. The Bible says we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn, and the day star arising, arise rather, in your hearts. The Bible says that prophecy is sure. A more sure word of prophecy. Men have risen up to defy the prophecies of God. Men have failed. Prophecy does not fail. Oh, it's good to have confidence in God's word. And it is a word you may have confidence in. You can stand on the word. When I am asked to preach, it is a great comfort to me to know that I'm standing on the unquestionable authority of the Word of God. And men may rise up and may differ and argue, but nothing, nothing can confound the Word of God. We have a sure word of prophecy. Now there are some things that we ought to consider. First of all, most of the prophecies of the Bible are now history. You've learned a lot of that, especially the other night when you saw the man dead from his head to his ankles. You remember that? That awesome prophecy of Daniel 2. We're down in the toes of the image. Most of prophecy is now history, and you can follow its trail. If you don't want to read the Bible, read history. You'll come to understand that God speaks and it comes to pass. Hardly anything is more comforting to me than that. If I didn't believe that, I could have no hope of eternal salvation. If I didn't believe that, I couldn't believe that I'm going to see my mother again. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't stand up here preaching to you. I wouldn't have anything to preach. And I want to tell you, I'm not that smart, and I don't have that much self-confidence, but I got enough confidence in God's Word to stand up here and look you straight in the eye and tell you like I was there when they wrote it. My mother used to mark her Bible T and P. One day as a child, I asked her what it meant. She said, son, that means I tried the Lord. I tested him. And the P means he proved himself. T and P, all through the word of God, tried it. He's been tested. Men who despise the Bible have tried to find some loophole, some problem, some lie, some contradiction, and they can't. It was authored by God himself. That is inspired. Now, this prophecy that we read the other night told us that a power would arise. This is Daniel 7, 25. A power would arise that would do three things that identifies the power. First of all, would blaspheme God's name. Speak great words against the Most High. Secondly, wear out the saints of the Most High. And thirdly, think to change times and laws. Beloved, we showed you. History attests that a religio-political power did emerge after the fall of Rome. This power came on the stage of action. 
this power fulfilled every detail of the prophecy. This power, the apostate church, the church that should have been the light of the world, became the purveyor of darkness and brought the dark ages, a dreary epoch on the entire world. The church brought the darkness. Once they removed the word of God, then they began to blaspheme God and his name by calling a man God. By ascribing to a man the prerogatives of God. By going further than even God can go. God said, I am the Lord, I change not. Malachi 3.6. Man says, I'm going to change God's law. And they voted at the council of Laodicea to disallow God's fourth commandment. Make a new Sabbath and shoot it up to commandment number three. They took out the one that says, don't bow down to idols and statues. Took it out. They think to change times and laws. And then they would wear out the saints of the Most High. They would make war against anybody who disagreed with him. He was called a heretic. And there's no name you can think of that was more damnable and disgraceful than that name during the Dark Ages. A heretic was anyone who did not go along with the dogmas of the apostate church. He was worse than a murderer. A heretic would be worse than the bomber in Oklahoma City. The reason is the bomber could be convicted and go to the electric chair and still receive the last rites. But a heretic couldn't even receive that. His soul, according to the church, was damned forever. All because he wouldn't go along with human laws and traditions and wanted to be faithful to the word of God. Oh, I encourage you tonight, if you expect, if you expect to see God's face in peace, one of the things you'd better pray for is courage. Because the devil's going to try you. And he is a, a, an intimidating devil. The Bible says he goeth about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I don't know what you know about lions, but I read a lot. And I read in National Geographic that the male lion, when he's with his pride, seldom kills. The female is the one that kills. They say that the male will walk out in a clearing when he gets hungry, and he'll stand and stretch, fill his lungs with air, and let go a blood-curdling roar that can be heard for more than a mile. And little animals that are prey get so scared, they stand and tremble. Lion hadn't even gotten there yet, and they are frozen in their tracks. And while they're standing there trembling, the female goes out and collects groceries. The Bible says the devil as a roaring lion goeth about seeking whom he may devour. And some of you are going to hear him roar. When you make up your mind to do God's will, you're going to hear him roar. You're going to hear him in your home. You're going to hear him on the job. You're going to hear him amongst your friends. He will roar. But he can't give you heaven or hell. He's just trying to scare you out of your birthright. He's trying to scare you out of doing God's will. The devil as a roaring lion. Amen. You'd better pray for courage. I told you the other night, no lily-livered coward can be saved in God's kingdom. You want lessons and courage, read the Bible. You want lessons and courage, read history. Fifty millions died during the dark ages rather than surrender their faith. Fifty millions, I say. But it started long before then. It started when Abel died because he wanted to obey God and Cain got angry with him. Down through the ages, it continued. There was a time when Daniel went into a lion's den. You got to have courage. The three Hebrew boys went in a fiery furnace. You got to have courage. Peter was crucified upside down. You got to make up your mind to stand for something. Paul's head was chopped off by Nero. You got to make up your mind to stand. Andrew and Bartholomew were flayed and, and, and skinned alive. You got to have courage. John was placed in a pot of boiling oil. 
all because of his faith. And yet today, you got a generation of people don't want to do anything for God. And the least little problem, they're ready to turn tail and run. Then go ahead and run. Somebody's going to stand for truth. And the devil's going to test you. Well, Jesus said to his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you and I will come again. And the coming of Christ, mentioned more than 300 times in the New Testament, became what Paul called the blessed hope. Everybody looked forward to it. Is there anybody here tonight that wishes Jesus would come? If so, say amen. amen. Oh yeah, when you get tired of sin, you want a sinless hope. When you get tired of this stupid world, you want to go live with Jesus. When you get tired of funerals, heartache and accidents, you want a safe place. If you love the Lord, you ought to long for him to come. Well, the early church longed for him to come. Now, Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 14, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. St. Paul said 32 years after that commission, there wasn't a creature under heaven that hadn't heard the gospel. Now, I want you to put these things together. Jesus said, when the gospel goes into all the world, the end will come. And 32 years later, Paul said, everybody's heard it. And all of a sudden, everybody begins to get excited. And they start talking about Jesus should come at any time. But what they forgot was, there was a sure word of prophecy amongst them. And the sure word of prophecy said, there was going to be an apostasy in the church. And the world would be led astray and led to do what man said, rather than what God said. So Paul had to come with some remedial counsel. I want you to listen to it. I'm reading 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'm beginning with verse 1. Listen to what the Bible says. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, now don't miss what I'm saying. Jesus said, when this gospel is preached, then where I'm coming. And the church got excited, saying, we're looking for it. And folks start writing and teaching like they do now, jumping off the deep end. Paul said, let me help you. If you get a letter, as from us. I don't want you trouble uh, concerning whether or not the day of Christ is at hand. Now listen to verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except, are you with me? All right. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Yeah. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, a man, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now that's explicit language. Amen. Daniel had said it 600 years before Christ was born. John wrote it in Revelation chapter 13. But Paul now is trying to help the church to get their bearing. Don't get excited saying Christ is going to come. There's got to come a falling away first. Daniel's prophecy has got to be fulfilled. John's prophecy has got to come to pass. So that day will not come, verse 4, until that man, verse 3 says, until that man, the son of perdition, be revealed. Verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. God can't even change his law. Man says, I can do it. He is opposing God and exalting himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Paul said, don't get excited. I told you when I was there. Amen. There came the falling away. And for over 1260 years of darkness, the entire world languished in gloom. Bereft of scripture. Bibles were collected and burned in public squares. If you were caught with one, you could be put to death. I read a story of that period of a woman 
And they didn't have whole Bibles. Sometimes they only had little parts of Bible. Bibles were precious and expensive. And this lady had a few scriptures that she lived by. And one day she had it out reading it surreptitiously as she was kneading bread, making herself a loaf of bread for her family. And there was a knock at the door. They were conducting a search. When she heard it and realized what it was, she grabbed up the scripture and rammed it into the door and kneaded the door around it and stuck it in the oven. And they came and searched and they didn't find a thing. And when they had gone, she pulled out a loaf of bread and she cut the physical bread and reached in there and pulled out the bread of life. Would somebody say amen? A sure word of prophecy and it came to pass. And then there came something else. A reformation came and the stranglehold of the apostate church was broken. A reformation came. There were many reformers, but perhaps none as successful as first, at first as Martin Luther. Martin Luther nailed his 95 arguments against dogma to the church door at Wittenberg on Halloween and created a stir, a fire that would spread across Europe. Eventually, he was called to debate the learned Dr. John Eck. And as I told you out here one night, he cut John Eck to shreds with the word of God. And after that, he was brought before Charles V of Germany, ordered to recant. And when Luther refused to deny his own truths that he had ferreted out by the grace of God, then he was excommunicated and subjected to papal anathema. His life wasn't worth a dime. Anybody helping him, just giving him a piece of bread, was also subject to papal anathema and excommunication. But there was a man there, Duke Frederick of Saxony. He had Luther kidnapped, took him out in the forest and put him in his castle. And Luther thought he was going to die, but instead he was getting good treatment and books were brought to him to read. And Luther decided not to waste his time. He started writing hymns. He wrote, a mighty fortress is our God, right. a bulwark never failing. But that isn't all he wrote. He decided to take the Latin that most people couldn't understand. And he translated it back into the language of the German people. And when he got it ready, the Germans had a printing press ready. And they began to print the word and scatter it. And as the word of God began to be scattered, the dark ages were on their way out. The light of God's word had come dispelling the darkness. A sure word of prophecy. Say amen out there. But something happened to the Reformation. It was incomplete. The people's main objective was to break free from Roman yoke. The taxes they had to pay. All of the things they were forced to do or die if they didn't do. And they began to follow men. And the sad thing is, instead of continuing as these great reformers had done, studying the word of God, as soon as a reformer died, they came to a screeching halt. They said, we won't believe anymore that our leader taught. And they drew up little creeds, little paragraphs, and said, this is our creed. This is it. They became creed bound and never completely shook off the shackles of human tradition which were perpetrated upon the whole world during the Dark Ages. The Reformation was incomplete. Are you following me? I want you to know that whenever God starts leading a man, he never comes to a place where he doesn't learn anymore. He never comes to the place where God can't lead him anymore. When God is leading a man, the Bible says the path of the just shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Some of you have been learning things out here you never knew before. Well, you're just scratching the surface. You'll be studying and learning the rest of your life. And if you get to heaven, we'll be studying the science of salvation throughout eternity. You'll never get to the place you know everything. Well, these churches became creed bound. They decided we won't believe anything our leaders didn't teach us. They even named themselves after the leaders. Those who followed Wesley were called Wesleyans. Those who followed Calvin were called Calvinists and so forth. Luther, they were called Lutherans. But I want to tell you something. Christ is the head of the church. And, and we are supposed to follow him. Would somebody say amen? amen? And so it became necessary 
expedient in the plan of God to raise up a remnant church. Now I want you to listen what his objective was for them. Isaiah 58 and verse 12. Write it down. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. They shall raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach. The restorer of paths to dwell in. God says I'm going to raise up a people. And they are going to be repairers of the breach. What is a breach? It's a break or a hole or a gap. In what? In his holy commandments. Everybody was willing to keep nine. But there was a breach where the fourth should be. God says I'm going to raise up somebody to repair the breach. If you think I'm making this up, let me read the very next verse. In fact, I'm going to read the twelfth again. Listen. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. The next verse says, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. And I'll cause you to ride on the high places of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord have spoken it. God said, I gotta find me somebody that will stand in the gap. I gotta find somebody that will pull things together. I gotta find me somebody that will plug up the hole. I gotta find somebody who will repair the breach. And they that be of thee shall build up the old, I said the old waste place. They'll go all the way back as far as my will goes. They're not interested in some newfangled stuff. They're going to get it out of the Old Testament and out of the New Testament. And they're going to repair the breach. God said it would happen. Amen. And then he highlighted the breach. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath. Well, after the Reformation came to a screeching halt, there was a great awakening. Happened around the middle of the last century. And then we come to Revelation chapter 13. There God speaks about the apostasy and then projects down to the end of time and says there will be an image to the beast and a mark of the beast. That's our subject, I believe, Sunday night. Or maybe tomorrow night. A mark of the beast. And if any man receive that mark in his forehead or in his hand now wait no need misunderstanding what does that mean you're going to either have the seal of God or the mark of the beast and the Bible says you can only get the seal of God in your forehead but you can get the mark of the beast in your forehead or in your hand what does it mean if you really believe it you get it in the forehead this is the seat of the mind this is where you think and make decisions. This is where you house your morals, your standards, and your convictions. And if you believe error, if you decide to believe man instead of God, you get it right here in the forehead. But a lot of people don't believe it. They don't believe anything. They just want a convenient life. They say, well, I don't necessarily believe it, but I got to keep my job. I, I got to do it for convenience sake. I got to do it or my husband might put me out of the house. I don't necessarily believe what man has done, but I got to do it in order to fit into society. I got to do it in order to, not to be ostracized. I got to do it in order for life to go on that I might buy or sell. You get it in the hand. Those who believe get it up here, but the seal of God can only be here. You got to believe God's truth. And so, ladies and gentlemen, in Revelation 13, the mark of the beast is introduced. Then you come to the very next chapter, Revelation 14. And there God speaks of 140 and 4,000 who are unaffected by all of this religious palaver. Doesn't matter that the whole world, according to Revelation 13, is wandering out to the beast. Everybody's going that way. There will be a group that will be pure. Bible says they are virgins. What does that mean? I told you the other night that an impure woman represents apostate church, but the pure woman represents the true church. Would you say amen? amen. 
And here God refers to his servants as virgins. They are uncontaminated by false doctrine. They are uncontaminated by the traditions of men. They follow the Bible and the Bible only. And the Bible says they are virgins because they are pure. Now what is this message God is sending to this last generation? I want you to follow me now as I go to Revelation chapter 14. And we're going to notice three specific messages which God is sending to the last age of this world. Revelation 14. Listen to what it says. And I'm going to go down to verse 6. And I saw another angel. Let's stop with that. The word interpreted angel in this version comes from a Greek word, Evangelion, which means messenger. Message or messenger. Are you with me? He said in verse 6, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Symbolic. Having the everlasting gospel. Having what? Everlasting. Not something new. One day somebody was listening to me preach about the Sabbath and they came up and said, but pastor, why are you coming up with something new? I said, look, the Sabbath that I preach goes back to the Garden of Eden. How old do you want it? First day of the week came at the Council of Laodicea in the fourth century after Christ. That's new. Truth is not new. It's old. The old Negro spiritual says, give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. Would you say amen out there? Now this says, I saw an angel fly in the midst of heaven, indicating swiftness, indicating urgency, having the everlasting gospel to preach. This angel is preaching. The message is to be preached. Yes, yes. Having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Now, now get the picture. The world has just emerged from the dark ages. The reformation has faltered. And now there comes an urgent message. Symbolized by an angel to be preached in all the world to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people saying with a loud voice. Somebody saying out here, you preach too loud. Well, I can't help it. And I don't want to hurt your feelings. I told my crew, turn the sound system down. You can't turn me down, turn the speaker down. But here I find that this message is to go with a loud voice. <laughs> Sing with a loud voice. Now listen. Fear God. Do what? And give glory to him. What? For the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. Here is the first message. It's the everlasting gospel. Nothing new. Same thing Adam and Eve heard. Worship God. Don't worship man. Do what God says. Don't do what you say. Huh? Now why would this message come like that? Because for 1,200 years, people didn't even have the Bible. And now the Bible has come back. It might be scarce, but it's come back. And men are beginning to read the Bible. And so there comes a message saying, fear God. You don't have to fear man anymore. Don't fear the soldiers coming and arresting you anymore. Fear God and give glory to him. Stop worshiping a man calling him God. Stop bowing down to a man calling him Holy Father. Fear God and give glory to him. When you were in the dark ages, I winked at it, Acts 17, 30. When you didn't know any better, I forbore. But now that you've got the word of God, you are without excuse. Fear God. Give glory to him. I will never bow down to a man as an act of worship. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Then it says, worship him. Stop worshiping man. Stop worshiping what man says. Worship him that made. Uh-oh, we're back to the creator here. Worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. I told you when we preached the Sabbath that if men kept the Sabbath, there could never be an infidel. Amen. Never be an atheist. 
How could somebody say there's no God when once every week they bow down and worship God? Fear God. Give glory to him. Worship him that made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. Now this appeal, this awakening went out around the middle of the last century. And what happened? For a while everybody got caught up in it. But then there came a time when suddenly everybody began to deride, to make fun. I want you to know that for scores of years you wouldn't hear anybody talk about the coming of Christ in any church except mine. And then Billy Graham started saying the end is coming. And others came on board. And as soon as they began to teach it, an error crept in. They started teaching about a rapture. There's nothing about it in the Bible. Nothing to substantiate it in the Word of God. The figment of somebody's spiritual imagination. Nothing in the Bible about a secret coming. Jesus said, when he comes, Revelation 1-7, every eye shall see him. Nothing about it. You know, I can't understand how people can come up with this stuff and can't prove it from the Bible. Can't find a text. And all of a sudden, they begin to say, Jesus is coming soon. He's coming in a rapture. He's going to sneak into town and sneak people out. <laughs> then he'll wait a while and everybody's going to get converted. You know that doesn't even make sense when you don't even read the Bible. If that's true, nobody will go to hell. And so, truth became corrupted. And the first angel's message was rejected. The difference between churches today is the difference in how much Romanism they kept and how much they threw out. The Church of England kept nearly everything. Instead of a pope, they got the Archbishop of Canterbury. They still have church and state. That's why Margaret couldn't marry Townsend. Church wouldn't allow it. Church! In the Episcopal Church, they got the mass and the altar and everything. It's just how much they kept and how much they threw out that created all these different denominations. The Baptists said, we're going to baptize. The Methodists said, no, we're going to sprinkle. And they went that separate way. You can go right here in this town and find churches on nearly every corner of an intersection. All worshiping Christ can't stand one another on Sunday. And the unsaved world looks at this and calls it confusion. And when they rejected the first angel's message, listen, verse 8. There followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The first angel said, look, you've been in ignorance, you've been in darkness. God was very sympathetic, but now that you've got the truth, fear God. Give glory to him. The hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. The restorers of the breach are told if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, the Sabbath especially points to God that in six days made the heaven and the earth. It's all tied together. And when the Protestant movement rejected this, they became formalized and in some cases sterile. And truth began to die again. And the second angel said, Babylon is fallen. Why Babylon? Babylon means confusion. It takes its idea from the Tower of Babel when men were defying God in disobedience and God came down and drove them and created the great diaspora and they diaspora and when they went out into the various parts of the world they spoke different languages and while they were at the tower it was called Babel or Babylon confusion and that's what religion is to a large extent today confusion Amen. we teach that when a man dies he goes straight to heaven and yet everybody fears death if you can go straight to heaven, you ought to want to die. Amen. Best thing that happened to your mother is let her die and go on to heaven. Amen. Well, who would want to keep mother out of heaven? Amen. That's confusing. Amen. They come and they stand before the body and say, she's in heaven. 
And then they sing, when the saints go marching in, I want to be in that number. Now, if they've already marched in, I want to stay here as long as I can. I don't want to be in that number. Confusion! Babylon is fallen. But notice it said twice, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. One inspired writer said, once for Romanism, once for apostate Protestantism. Babylon is fallen, Romanism is fallen, apostate Protestantism that clings to Rome's mark. And the third angel followed them saying, verse 9, with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. The same, verse 10, shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of that torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever received the mark of his name. That's clear. That's hell. Amen. And the third angel says, if you receive it, you're going to hell. If you receive the mark in your head or your hand, you're going to hell and you'll burn and the smoke ascends forever and ever. That's verse 11. Now look at the next verse, 12. Who's left after all this burning? Listen to it. So simple. Oh God, help us to see it. Listen to it. Who's left? Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. And the faith of Jesus. Would somebody say amen? amen? One group gets the mark up here, here. And they are destroyed. And after the destruction, John sees it. This conflagration taking multiplied billions of people up in smoke. And he wonders where is anyone left? And the angel showed him. Here they are. Here they are. Here is the patience of the saints. Who are they? They keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Oh, beloved, this is the message sent to our day. For over 1,200 years, they were in darkness. Bible came back. In 1810, the British Bible Society was formed. In 1815, the American Bible Society. They give away Bibles now. Used to cost a fortune to get a Bible. Now you can get one free. We give them out out here sometime. Free. Amen. Lady got a great big $75 Bible last weekend. Free. Yeah. Trouble isn't that we don't have Bibles. It's that we don't want to read the Bible. We don't hear. We don't want to hear what the Bible says. We're going along with the crowd. And the crowd has never been right. Matthew 15, 1 to 3. Jesus said, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth honoreth me with their lips but their heart is far from me verse 9 in vain do they worship me teaching for doctrine the commandments of men yes, sir. Yes, sir. it's not an easy message but it's the truth Amen. I picked up this so let's go to the screen and review quickly and all go home ladies and gentlemen there is that awesome scripture of prophecy concerning apostasy and what it would do. Speak great words against the Most High, wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change God's law. And it happened. I want you to follow this. The Word of God was burned. The Word of God was destroyed. The Word of God was forbidden. You couldn't even be found with it. And they could put you to death for that. That's why the Bill of Rights was written in this country. That a man could have freedom of worship. And that no soldiers could come to his house. And that he shouldn't endure cruel and unusual punishment. These are amongst the bills of right, rights. Addendums to our Constitution. And we read all this stuff, don't even know what it means. Most folk don't even know what a Protestant is. They don't know why the pilgrims came over here. You ought to read. They didn't come over here for a pleasure trip, an ocean cruise. They came over here to worship God as they plead. 
and most of them were dying at sea. And when they came into Plymouth, New England, Massachusetts, it was cold. And they came ashore, stepped on a rock. I have stepped on that rock. When they got up on the bank, they knelt down in the snow and thank God. Thank God didn't even have a house, didn't have any food, didn't have anything. But they thank God. And you putting house and food and everything else ahead of God? Huh? Forgive me. The dark ages were brought on by the church. Martin Luther, the intrepid Augustinian monk began to turn things upside down. And he stood and said, as he studied the scriptures, the just shall live by faith. Not all this stuff by works, that's heathenism. You can't pay enough money to get out of purgatory into heaven. You're saved by grace, Amen. free. Amen. Luther started a revolution, light came. When the Bible came, light returned. Would somebody say amen out there? Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says, I'm reading it now from Isaiah 58. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundation of many generations. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure. It's Isaiah 58, 12 and 13. It is the word of God, and it's called a sure word of prophecy. Revelation 13 reveals the mark of the beast, discusses it in very clear language. And the next chapter, John said, I saw a vision of three angels. The first angel was flying in the midst of heaven. And that angel was to lighten the whole world with his glory. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Revelation 14, 6. Ladies and gentlemen, that first angel was trying to call men and women back to the word of God and away from apostasy, away from tradition away from that which is totally unscriptural. That angel's message was to call men back to worship God instead of a man who called himself God. Amen. That's what that angel was to do, and that's what he did. And the whole world was enlightened in what they call the Great Awakening. But the churches hardened themselves and would not change. And when they would not change, we are told that there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. What's wrong with Babylon? Because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So another angel followed, and he bore that striking message to a whole generation of people who were hard in their rebellion against God, refused to give up man-made dogma and tradition and commandments and false Sabbath and false teaching. They held on to it. And the common bond amongst all of them is Sunday. Yes. Baptist, Methodist, Holiness, Pentecostal, Mormon, everybody, Sunday. And it is the offspring of the Roman church. Amen. You'll be here tomorrow night and I'll give you the documentation. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. That's what's ahead. This is the last message. This is it. Amen. This is it. It's not a popular message, church. You've got to hear God speak. You can't wait on some handsome, eloquent preacher. That ain't me. You got to listen to God's word. Amen. You got to hear the Spirit saying, This is the way. This is the truth. And to rebel against it could mean a mark eventually in your forehead or in your hand. It says you'll be tormented in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Revelation 14, 9 and 10. That is the third angel's message. But then there's another. There's one more. The Bible tells us that the stranglehold of error is broken. You don't have to listen to it. The truth is here. Truth is not truth because I say it. Truth is truth because God says it. 
Let me tell you, Sabbath is not Sabbath because you come here to church. Sabbath is Sabbath if you go to the ball game. It's still Sabbath. Sabbath is not Sabbath because you join a church. It's the Sabbath no matter what you do. We cannot change the truth of God. The stranglehold of error is broken. And I heard another voice from heaven say, here's that fourth angel over in 18 and verse 4. I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. Not calling everybody. Come on, say amen. Oh, now, 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 wait a minute. Don't misunderstand me. Everybody may come, but those who respond will become his people. Yes, sir. Is that clear? Amen. My people. Now, the enemy has his people, and apostasy has its people. But God says, I got some people, Brooks. Over in Phoenix, I got some people. Amen. I got some that own drugs right now, but they're mine. Amen. Lord, how can you say they're mine? Because when they hear the truth, they're coming out. They're coming out like those sheep I told you about last night. They hear the shepherd's voice and they come out. When you come out, you're his people. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. What is sin? Come on, come on, come on, say it. What is sin? God says, come out that you are not a partaker of law breaking and that you receive not of her plagues because I'm going to judge her with the seven last plagues get out of there before I start raining down the plagues come out of her my people God said and eventually they'll be turned into the flames of hell the third angel said they are going to burn with fire and brimstone and the smoke of that torment ascended up forever and ever but there's another crowd glory to God there's another crowd and they are going to be welcomed home to glory with Jesus. Oh, when the saints go marching in. I want to be in that number, don't you? I don't want to be hanging around down here with folk waiting on fire and brimstone. I want to hear the trumpet sound. And if I have to sleep, I want to come up out of that cold, cold ground. Because I don't plan to stay here, children. I don't plan to stay. And I'm doing what I can to tell somebody else. Jesus is inviting us home. There's not a lot of other things yet to happen. This is the last message. This is God's message to a lost generation. Come out. Break the unequal yoke. Stand on the word of God and the word alone. Because one day you're going to be in one crowd or the other. You're going to have the seal of God and I welcome you home. Or you're going to have the mark of the beast and you wait for the fire and the brimstone. I want to go to heaven, don't you? Amen. Now, have you understood me tonight? If you had, say amen. amen. Do you understand that you've got to do God's will to go to heaven? Amen. Do you understand you've got to have courage? Can't make excuses. God never tells us to do anything without enabling us. If God tells me to jump through that wall, my job is to jump and God's job is to open a hole. He never asks you to do what can't be done. Get off these excuses. My grace is sufficient for them. I will make a way somehow. We are not playing games. I didn't come out here to entertain you. To preach what's preached all the time. I came to tell you these three messages. And to show you that God loves you with unspeakable love, he doesn't want anybody in this room to be lost. Amen. Wants us saved. He loves you. How do I know? Because he's made me love you. I don't want you. I lie in bed at night saying, Lord, please. Please don't let it be in vain. If it's not going to mean any more than that, I could have stayed home with my wife. Please, Lord. I didn't come out here for money. You don't even pay me. I'm free. You don't have to pay me. All I'm interested in is that somebody will hear his voice and come out of Babylon. Tomorrow, service convenes here where we worship according to the word of God and not 
the word of Rome. 950. And some I already had excuses ready. Oh Lord, help them to see that the end is near and you are more important than friends, more important than jobs, more important than ball games, more important than shopping, more important than anything else because soon none of that will matter. When this terrible tragedy struck in Oklahoma, the president came on and I thank God he did. His face was torn up, he was emotional. And he said, let us pray. And I thought, Lord, yes, yes, let us pray. We've been praying for the folk in Oklahoma. But you know, we shouldn't just wait for trouble to pray. When the chips are down, pray. Soon as we get used to it. Earthquake struck in California, churches were packed on Sunday. It lasted three weeks. Then it was business as usual. We got to have a permanent experience. Got to make a decision. Got to stand by. And if you make it, you're going to be tested. Devil's going to see if you got the stuff. Stand. God will stand with you. Never let you down. Never fail. And he'll plant something in your heart. Put a joy in your life. He said, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. God will keep his word. You wake up in the middle of the night praising God. You're not scared to go to sleep. Not scared to hear a sermon on the judgment. You got a lawyer in court. Go on to heaven with Jesus. I want to be there. These men try to paint scenes, but they can't do it. The Bible says, I have not seen nor ear heard. Neither has entered the heart of man the things that God is going to prepare for them to love. One person who saw it in vision said, the grass waved before King Jesus as though each was a strand of God. Now if the grass is that wonderful, everything else must be all right. He's going to prepare a mansion. You know, I've seen some mighty homes in Phoenix. I saw the area where Charles Barkley lives. Got plenty of money. We poor folks can only look at it and say, isn't that wonderful? But when I get to heaven, a tent or a cottage, what do I care? He's building a mansion for me over there. No exile from home. Still I will sing glory to God. I'm a child of the king. Better day is coming for me. Better day after a while. Don't have to worry about money. I'm going to walk around on it. Streets of gold, gates of pearl. Don't worry about getting sick with a cold. The Bible says the inhabitant of that land shall not say, I am sick. God shall wipe away all tears from there. Be no more death, neither sorrow nor sighing, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Revelation 21 4. I want to go, and he made a way. Doesn't make sense to go to hell. Jesus has worked it out and all the debt you owed he's paid Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow the books are clear when I repent it's stupid to go to hell don't have to go he has paid and he didn't pay with silver and gold Peter said but with his precious blood he paid with the gold of his blood and the silver of his tears. He paid. And if nothing moves you, look at the cross. One writer said, if the cross doesn't move you, all the horrors of hell can't frighten you into being a Christian. Look at the cross and see God die. Covered with blood and sweat and spit. Look at the cross see the flies crawling in his wounds and the buzzards circling overhead look at the cross and see God oh how he loved us not necessary to be lost I want courage to obey God under all circumstances I plan to do it how about you if you do stand and pray with me again tonight 
Oh, Father, you see us. You know us. Save us, we pray. There is someone who cares, but time is running out. There is someone who cares. Don't yield to fear and doubt. There is someone who cares. His grace is all about. For that someone who cares is Jesus. There is someone who cares. The last warning is being heard. There is someone who cares. Turn from where you've erred. There is someone who cares. Cling to his precious word. For that someone who cares is Jesus. And now may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace.